Hello, this is Mike, and welcome to the next part in our ongoing SFML tutorial. Uh, by ongoing, I mean the second part. Uh, in the previous part, we covered setting up a Visual Studio environment. So obviously, if you're following along from uh, Mac on Xcode or using a different compiler, you may not have needed that part and skipped along. But mostly, it was all about configuration. Uh, but at the very end of it, I did a very, very simple uh, SFML application. And we're going to start there and continue on. Uh, this tutorial series is going to always assume you've seen or understand the content in the previous tutorial series, and this is the first real one about coding. Um, I do assume, though, as I said, you have gone through the previous. I won't be repeating what I've already covered. Uh, so if I lose you, and the only place I can really lose you on this one is on the configuration part, but if you don't know how to set up your linker and your include paths and things like this, refer to the previous tutorial. Otherwise, uh, let's move on. Now, what we're covering today, very simple concept, uh, we're essentially covering the game loop. Now, we're going to go into a little bit more detail later on down the road. Like I said, I'm going to try and keep these tutorials a little bit more bite-sized than I normally do so that uh, you can flip through them a little bit faster. So we're going to focus today very specifically on you know, creating your main window and updating it. So the every, at the heart of every single game ever made, there's a game loop. And a game loop is exactly what it sounds like, a loop in which your game runs. And it does things like... Um, checks input, updates the physics, draws things to the screen. And at this point in time, all we're really gonna do is the draw to the screen part. And then in the next part, we'll add a little bit of um, input code. Uh, so I'm gonna carry on from where we kind of left the last one. I'm gonna create a very, very basic application about as simple of an application as that you can in SFML. And first off, uh, let's go ahead and add our include file. So if you have an error here, you have your set up wrong. Uh, so if you do and you're using Visual Studio, refer to the previous post. Uh, otherwise, you go to the SFML uh, documentation. There's actually pretty good documentation on configuring it for just about every single compiler out there. Um, so if you do get a problem at this point, are you going to have a problem when you compile? That's probably where it is. And I repeat this because a lot of newer developers and actually even experienced developers run into configuration issues with C++. So it's not shocking if you do. Uh, but if that's the case, if you run it, like if you compile at this point and you get any kind of an error, that's your issue. Also make sure that you set the library, the library file includes correctly at this point too. Uh, so assuming everything's correctly, we're going to go ahead and create a main window, which is sort of the heart of your application, uh, clear it and draw it. And that's it. So to do so, we create a render window and we'll call it render window. And uh, pass in a couple parameters. The first one is the video resolution of the window, like so. Um, and then finally a title, like so. By the way, all of the source code we're doing here today is available on gamefromscratch.com. I'll link below to directly to the post with the relevant source code. And of course, there will be, at least when I get a little further along, I'll create a table of contents so you can track the entire series from one spot. So don't worry too much if I don't keep up with you on the code, you can get it from the site. But let me switch over into presentation mode so you can actually see what I'm doing a bit better. I always forget to do this. All right, turn that on. So hopefully that's a little bit better. Let's just zoom this in a little bit more. All right, hopefully you can read that. Uh, so basically all we've done here is we created a render window object. A render window, as I said, is basically the heart of your application. It's the window, but it also handles events like um, you know your mouse, your keyboard, etc. So create the window, uh, set the size to 640 by 480, the title to SFML demo. And now we're gonna create that um, game loop I was talking about. And this one in this case is gonna be very, very, very simple and very, very, very flawed, by the way. And all we're really doing here is looping forever. So while true, and then the first thing we want to do, oops, I switched keyboards recently, so I'm a little fat fingered right now. Uh, render window, and then the first thing you do is clear. So whatever you drew to it, the last frame, a frame basically being uh, the, the drawing of your screen since the last time. And so each one of those is considered a frame or it comes from frames of animation. Um, it's basically every loop you draw your screen, that's considered a frame. Um, so the first thing you do is clear the results of the last frame, and then we're just gonna go ahead and display our current frame. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, yeah, but you didn't do anything. Good point, uh, but some point in the future, obviously, we will add that. So that's all our code here is going to do. And as I said a second ago, it is incredibly flawed, and we'll deal with that flaw today. So don't worry about that too much. I'm just gonna go ahead and run that. And here you will see I actually misconfigured this project. Um, that's just I didn't copy the DLLs in. Uh, not a big deal. So I'll just go into bin, 
I'll be lazy about it, just bring them all, even though I only need a couple of them. The downside is you need to do your first compile before you have your debug folder, before you can copy these in. So, all right, let's try that again. And there you go, here is your application. Now when I said it was flawed, I meant it was flawed. Look at this, I can't move it, I can't resize it. Um, I can move and change the underlying window that's created for it, which by the way, we can get rid of. But you'll notice now that I've even moved this, I can't even focus this back window. And that's because we are not responding to any of the events being sent to it. That window is essentially hanging right now. And that's on purpose, sort of. And it's, not, it's not really behavior you want, but it's behavior we're going to fix in the next section. So you can close this window down by clicking the X here to, to um, kill the, ho the host console window, or you can just press stop up here. So welcome to your very first SFML application. It doesn't do a damn thing. Basically, it creates a window and clears it and displays it clears it, displays it, clears it, displays it forever. Now, obviously, we want it to actually respond to events. We don't want it to just hang there. We want to be able to mouse over it. We want to be able to pass things back to the system so it knows to be able to move it around, to give it focus and all that. So now let's look at that process. And I'm just going to build on top of the existing code we've got here. And we're going to cover a couple things in this. We're mostly going to cover just um, handling those events. And then in the next tutorial, we'll actually look specifically at input events or keyboard events. Uh, but now we're just going to cover polling events. And as I said earlier, the heart of your application is ultimately that render window. Now what we want to do is run our code until that window is actually closed. So we're going to put our while loop inside of another while loop. And this one's going to be while render window dot is open. So as long as the window is open, this loop will keep running like so. And then our inner loop, I'm going to change that up a little bit. So instead of actually, this loop is essentially being replaced by this one. So instead of running forever, it's going to run until we close. But we do want an internal loop, but it's going to be much, much different. And in fact, these aren't going to be inside of it. So let me just, yeah, let's just get rid of everything. Ooh, I am in a weird editing mode. Right, I do not know what I just did there. There. All right. So. While our window is open, we're going to just keep running this over and over and again. Now what we want to do is pull for events. And you can do that with render window dot uh, pull event consistent enough. Now we actually need to pass in the event object where the event is going to be stored if there is an event. Um, and that means we need a new variable. And we don't want to create one every single pass through the loop. That's just wasteful. We only really need one event at a time here. So we'll just create one outside of the scope of the, the uh, outer while loop and the inner while loop. Otherwise, as I said earlier, we'd be creating a new event class every single frame. And for performance reasons, that's one of those things you got to be very careful of in, in any programming language. You don't want to create variables in a loop ever unless there's a very good reason for it. So we'll create this outside loop. So we've only got one and we'll reuse it over and over again. And we pass that into this uh, render window pull event call. Um, this guy will return false if there's no more events. Now I set something there very key, no more events. You see, from the last frame to the current frame, it's possible that multiple events occurred. And events fire a lot. Uh, for example, when you move your mouse, you're generating like a lot of events. So you could be moving your mouse, holding down the control button, um, and various other things all at once. So it's not unheard of to have multiple events happen since the last frame. Now, it's possible that they don't. They're going to have many, many, many calls where there's going to be no events at all. But as I said, it is possible since the last time you called pull event, there's actually multiple events. And it's sort of like a stack. So each time you call it, it gets rid of one. And so you've got, so say five events occurred, then you call pull event four, three, two, one, until there are none, and then we'll continue on. But now we have to do is check all of the current queued up events. And that means another while loop. So while more or less what we're saying here is while render, rend, well, render window.pull event is returning that yes, there are events, uh, we'll keep pulling them. And then inside of the logic for that, we're now gonna handle that event. And we're only gonna really handle one event here. And that is the closed event. So our window will actually shut down when you click the X, unlike in the previous example. And now this pull event will have populated our event class here, our, our event object here with the results of the pulled event. And now we're just gonna work with it a bit. So now we're using if. So if I pressed a weird key, I hate switching keyboards. If event dot type, so we're checking what kind of event occurred, and the types are defined in SF uh, colon colon the event namespace colon colon event type enum. So the event type enum is where all of the different uh, kinds of events are defined, 
and the event one that we specifically want. So as you can see here, there are a lot of different events that can happen. You can have a closed counter uh, gained focus, which is like someone clicked on our window, um, joystick, various joystick events, various key events, which we'll see very shortly, uh, lost focus, which obviously is someone clicked on another window, uh, our mouse events, uh, resize events, sensor events for mobile or I guess desktop nowadays, um, text entered events, touched, event. So there are several, several, several different events that can occur. And as I said earlier, a lot of them actually can occur at the same time. So you do need this while loop. Otherwise, you will only get the most current event since the last frame. So now we want to check for event closed, like so. So if the event type is closed, and now the logic of this window comes into place. Remember, we got out here saying this loop will run every frame while the window is open. So if we want this loop to stop running, um, you know, we could do a break, we could do a, a flag to say that we're done, but a much easier way to do it is just to say render window close. So the logic here is we, we run this outer loop forever. This loop will run every single time there is an event. Um, and when that event is the close, we'll set, we'll call the close method. And then this will now return false. And we will now continue on executing here. So basically, and uh, execution. Nothing happens down there. We're, we don't have any logic down there. Now, we're not done though, because we still have the same logic we had from last time. We still need to clear the display and display it every frame. Now, you don't do it in here, inside of this while loop, or it will be, um, you'll only update your um, screen when an event occurs. So basically your drawing will be tied to your mouse, to your keyboard, etc. And you can actually create a somewhat insidious bug by doing that. So you want to make sure that you're outside of the scope of this one, but you do want to call it every single frame. So you want to make sure that it's in this guy right here. And there's your other catcher. Is this potential? No, we won't bother with going there. Just make sure that you're outside of this inner while loop and still on the inside of the other loop. So render window dot clear like so, and then render window dot display like so and we're done now it's not going to be the most exciting demo uh, but it is going to run a little bit better assuming I didn't typo anything there you go exact same result but now you'll notice I can mouse over and our window actually responds to event and clicking the X will now close our application so you basically just created your first full actually functional SFML application there um, now there's only one other thing I want to talk about here. And one thing that's very common, especially if you come from a previous game engine or a different game engine, one thing that you're very used to is your, your invent loop here. Right now we're really only got, well now we're handling, um, we're handling input events and we're handling uh, the draw events every path through the loop, which is uh, pretty normal. But one thing that's very common here, especially when you've got a bunch of game objects and such that you need to update is an elapsed time. And again, in many game engines, you're actually past that. You, you implement a, a method like uh, loop or update or render or draw, and it's passed in a delta time that uh, often in milliseconds, how long has elapsed since the last pass through the frame? This is very useful for a lot of reasons. We'll see down the road, uh, one very common use for this delta time is to make uh, animations run the same speed on a myriad of computers because all different kinds of computers have uh, different processors, obviously. So if you just run as fast as possible on the newest machine, it would probably be way, way, way too fast. Or on a slower machine, it would be sluggish as hell. So you use that elapsed time per frame to normalize the amount of animate by. And again, we'll cover that in a moment, but I'm gonna show you now, before we close out this tutorial, just one last thing, and that's how to actually calculate that yourself. And again, it's not passed in in SFML. There's no global value for this but it's very easy to do. We're gonna use an object called SF clock. And clock, oops, I guess I should actually create one, like so. Uh, clock is an object that basically you can think of it like a stopwatch. And the minute you create one, it's running. So now that we create a clock there, it's counting down. And clock is very simple. Clock only has two methods attached to it. One is to check the value of clock, and the second is to start the clock over again. So it's literally analog an analogous to a stopwatch. So every time you do a lap, you click the button, and it starts it over, starts it over, starts it over. That's the exact same logic we want here. And now I'm gonna just go ahead and show you, all I'm gonna do is dump out the amount of elapsed time um, to standard out. And this is one of those nice things about having that console window that's being created uh, along with our window. Uh, so we can, we can write the bug code out to it, no problem. And so in order to do this, let's go ahead and add IO stream to our project. So pound include IO stream, so we want C out. And now what we're gonna do is for our clock, every, every frame before we draw, so right about here, 
we're going to go ahead and print out the uh, elapsed time. So very simple, standard out, uh, C out, and we are going to pass out, let's say, elapsed time in Microsoft, micro seconds. Like so, and we will use clock dot get elapsed time and then as microseconds now a uh, microsecond so here's your catch is, is you've got things um the amount of time this loop is very 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 fast and the, the resolution of clock is actually very 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 high um so we're dealing with fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a second and um uh, one microsecond sorry a thousand microseconds is one millisecond and then one millisecond is a thousandth of a second. So you've got a thousand milliseconds in a second and a thousand microseconds in a millisecond. So if you're very good at math, what that means is there are one million microseconds in a second. So it's a very high precision number that we're using here. Um, you have options, you also could have gotten as milliseconds, but the amount of, the, the amazing thing is a frame updates in less than one millisecond. So that's why microseconds a handy little number. And we'll just dump out the, uh, uh, results, new line at the end, and I don't think I did any typos there. Excellent. Now I told you earlier, clock has two methods. One we just used, get elapsed time. Basically this is just saying how long um, has gone on since the last time we restarted the clock. And coincidentally, that's the second method. So now that we've found out how long has, um, since our last lap, I guess you could think of it there, or our last frame, how long has elapsed, we now know, and we want to reset our clock. So this is a very easy way to track the amount of time and how fast your game is running. And there's very easy math you can use to turn this into frames per second, etc. We'll see that later on again. Don't worry about it now. Um, so all that we've really changed here is now we're timing it. So every pass through our loop, we're actually seeing how long that loop took to execute. And ironically, this C out call is probably going to take more time to make than the entirety of the rest of your loop. But we're not dealing with fidelity at this point. So I just want you to get the concept of what's going on here. I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Exact same code, obviously, but you can see here in the background, uh, we're looking two, 300 microseconds. So we're talking, there is an update happening every fourth of a millisecond. So that's why we need the precision here. So this loop is happening very, 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 very fast. Um, and we'll use this clock timer type stuff a lot more in the future because you're gonna have as your game gets more complicated, you're gonna have more game objects and game objects need to know time. It's, it's almost a universal requirement and this is how you provide it. And that's all we're gonna to cover today. So basically, uh, we just looked at creating your simple application, uh, polling it for events, um, displaying each frame and clearing the results. And that's kind of it. And we looked a little bit at timers, precisions for timers. And as I said, we'll get into their use a little bit more going forward. Uh, but I wanna keep these again, as I said, bite-sized and hopefully that one was. Uh, carry over to the next part, we're gonna look at handling keyboard input and a little bit on random numbers, which aren't technically part of SFML anymore, but they are very key to understanding game development. So uh, stay tuned for that tutorial. I hope you enjoyed this one. And once again, there is a link in the bottom to uh, a text-based version of this with the source code. Um, also, there will be a link to my patron if you like this content and want to keep seeing more. All your uh, assistance is definitely appreciated. Anyways, hope you enjoyed that. See you soon.